Welcome to the Less Doing Podcast, where you will learn how to start living more by doing less. Let me help you optimize, automate, and outsource your entire life so you can focus on doing the things you love. Now here's your host, Ari Mizell. Welcome back to the Less Doing Podcast. I'm your host, Ari Mizell, and my guest today is Michael Chang, who is the founder of, I think, the the, the new favorite platform of my team, which is Lumen5. So, uh, Michael, thank <laughs> you for joining us. That's awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so it's it's funny. So, well, first of all, for people who don't know, actually, I'll let you describe. For, for people who don't know what Lumen5 is, can you tell everyone what it is? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. A bit of a background. Uh, when we first started building Limit Five, we wanted to solve a very simple problem. Everybody wants to make video because video works really well for marketing and social and communication, but it's really hard to make videos. So we set out to create the world's simplest video creator. It's all AI assisted. You drop in a link, it helps you turn blog posts into videos with minimal work. Most of our users are able to produce compelling, engaging videos within five to ten minutes, and that's what Limit Five does. So uh, it's funny because. As a creator, like I've always seen on, uh, you know, on Facebook, you see these videos by like David Wolf and like all these different people who have like these videos with text on them and like images moving around. You're like, how do they make that like all the time and easy? And um, is honestly kind of frustrating. Uh, and then Lumen5 came out and it's just, it's so easy. I made my first video and actually like three minutes. So oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And so just for my description for people, like you put in, like, let's say you have an article on Medium, you drop that in and it will highlight what it thinks are like key phrases and things you can of course edit that and then it will use intelligence to pick images for you that go along with it or video and everything and put it together and add sound to it so you you could not edit it at all and really be done in a minute or two and have a visual representation that works really well on facebook and other platforms um so how you know a lot of a lot of a lot of platforms talk about using ai right but how much ai is really involved here yeah, I don't, I don't. I can't speak for other platforms that claim to be AI, <laughs> uh, but definitely, definitely from our standpoint, even when we hire people, we're hiring masters and PhDs and people who actually have a scientific background in machine learning and artificial intelligence. And uh, so, as you've described, the first bit of AI that you'll encounter is text summarization, and specifically, it's an aspect of text summarization called natural language processing, which is how do you take a long article and a long blog post and produce an effective summary? Because when you're writing a blog post, you're maybe targeting a five or six minute read. But when you're producing a video, you're really looking for that sweet one minute video or two minute video. So the summarization aspect requires a high level of intelligence to be able to know what is the article trying to talk about. We have to be able to recognize that this is a list. So we want to make sure that we're going point for point as opposed to just summarizing the first three points. Um, And that's the natural language processing side. And then the other side is the computer vision side, which is the media matching. After we understand what the text is about, the system has to go then interpret interpret that and turn those into tags for which it uses to find media files. So are you writing an article about sushi or hamburgers or pizzas? And so all of that is what the AI uh, comprises of. And that's what makes it so easy to create a video in Lumen5 because you basically don't have to do much. You're Instead of creating a video from scratch, what you're doing is actually proofreading and editing uh, almost as if an intern has produced a video pass it to your desk, and then you just have to check some boxes and decide, you know, is this what I like? Is this what I don't like? Uh, and that's the experience that we wanted to go for. Now, the, the image part of it is really interesting to me because uh, I've, I've used text classifiers before that'll, and I don't want to get too technical for people who don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm, I'm still going to geek out on this because it's interesting to me. Uh, text classification is one thing, but when you get into the image, the computer vision stuff, like, is, is that, it's a, that's sort of another level of complexity. Yeah, so uh, a lot of people actually probably have encountered this before. So on Facebook, for example, if you have any friends who are uh, visually impaired or or blind, you might have noticed that on their Facebook, they have a special accessibility version of Facebook that actually describes images for them. So if you post a picture of you posing in front of an Eiffel Tower, uh, algorithms would be able to tell you selfie, photo, 
person, Eiffel Tower, Paris, France. So there's a lot of computer vision technology out there, uh, some of which are open source and some of which we're definitely building in-house. Uh, and it's a big part of creating a video. I think a big hurdle for a lot of people when it comes to video creation is that even if you have the idea, even if you have the storyboard, where are you going to get the visuals? Are you going to go out and hire a photography team or a videography team to capture the footage? Uh, and that's why we scour the web on Creative Commons for millions and millions of copyright-free media files. Uh, also, we work with premium partners like Storyblocks and Getty to be able to deliver high-quality assets as well. Um, and all of that kind of comes together because without the without access to media files the intelligence component doesn't matter even if you know that the article is about sushi you still have to have the media of, of sushi to be able to combine those two together so it's a it's a two-sided battle and it's something that we work on every single day and what's sort of the uh the i guess the grand vision here uh, i mean i was I, I guess just improving it but then like what what what's next I think um, the way we see ourselves is that it's not so much as what's next for us. Of course, we're going to help people create videos. We're going to help people create videos faster, make sure that they're engaging and converting. But we also see social as a landscape that's constantly changing. And we see our story as one of adaptation. Because if you look at um, where social was five years ago, uh, video wasn't quite around. And it wasn't until mobile became a big thing, mobile data especially became a big thing, and people started to be able to watch videos on the go because now they have the data and the device to be able to load videos from the web. Uh, and I don't think that's the end. I think lots of things are happening, Instagram, Snapchat, AR, VR. Uh, and I think our role is to constantly help brands and businesses and all sorts of different people who are interested in producing digital content evolve as the social landscape evolves. So we'll continue to work on video so long as video is the big content king. Um, but in the future, it, it could be AR, it could be VR, and we want to apply the same uh, intelligence and AI onto whatever form that consumers prefer to consume their content. Yeah, so the, fun, the, the cool thing about this for me too is that video is the hardest medium to produce for most people, right? right. Because I, I do video a lot and I have my podcast, obviously, that we're talking on, and I do my blog posts, things like that. The, the easiest thing f in general for me would be just to have my iPhone record a message and have somebody write it up and do it. Video definitely requires more work and more planning and whatnot. So this uh, sort of circumvents that in my opinion and really makes right. it, it's, it's a totally different process. Um, so I, I love that too. Uh, as far as the uh, the the business itself, like what is your what does your team look like? What, what were, you know, What's your background? Yeah, so we're a team of seven currently, so uh, three co-founders. So myself, I take up uh, a lead of business development. Um, I'm designed by education, so I studied UI, UX design, and fascinated by how you can take a complicated process like video editing and through kind of smart and catered UI UX design, create a very simple workflow of point and click, drag and drop. And for those who haven't encountered Lumen5 interface before, it, it kind of looks a lot like PowerPoint. And the design philosophy is that we want to turn video editing into an interface that people are familiar with and understand, because oftentimes people load up After Effects or Final Cut Pro, and they're just devastated because you've got timelines and layers and you've got a canvas and a media library. So we really try to simplify that experience um, by redesigning the video editing workflow into something that people look at and go, oh, I've seen something like this before and make it intuitive for people to say, oh, of course I drag and drop this here. And of course I click to rearrange the slides and so forth. Um, both of my other co-founders are engineers, great developers, and they, they built the whole thing when we first started. Uh, and then now our team comprises of seven and Total with a machine learning specialist, backend developers, uh, another UI and UX designer. Um, yeah, that's the composition of our team. And currently, we're we're constantly hiring. We're looking for more people to be able to help us on both the intelligence front, but also the video quality front. Um, what we work on is kind of the intersection of science and arts. There's the science, the intelligence component. There's also a high level of subjectivity when it comes to um, when it comes to video. We want to make things look good. And for that, we're looking at text animation, scene transitions. How do you make a video look as good in landscape as you do in portrait? or square. Uh, so those are some of the positions that we're actively recruiting for. Um, and then in terms of the growth of the company, like, so are you, are you remote for the most part? Are you guys in the same place? And we're all based in Vancouver, Canada. Okay. So like, what's the, uh, what's the growth challenge for you guys right now? 
I think one of the main growth challenges is definitely the, the intelligence side. So it's a, a kind of a chicken and egg. We constantly strive to improve the intelligence, but the, for those unfamiliar, machine learning requires a large data set to be able to train the system to make better decisions. Um, in a nutshell, how it works is system makes a recommendation, you either replace it or you accept it. And if you replace it, it, it tells the system that it made a bad decision and it tries to do better next time. And so the more users we have, the better the system can be. But of course, it's a chicken and egg in the sense that if the intelligence is not good enough, then you can't attract enough users to be able to train the system. So uh, on my personal side, I work on a lot of user acquisition strategy. Um, and we're very fortunate to have very strong word of mouth. People really like Lumen5 and like what they see. And so a lot of our user acquisitions do come organically. When you have people who are, have an artificial intelligence background, so this is something I don't have any experience with in terms of this specific aspect of it. Uh, if, if they're building something together, but there are different sort of like, how, like how does a group improve an artificial intelligence algorithm? If do you know what I'm, do you know what I'm asking? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and, and I think um, the, the short answer is we followed the data. Uh, we watch very closely how users respond to some of the automated decisions. So uh, one example is we have um, we automatically highlight keywords. The system looks at a sentence and recognizes what the user intends to emphasize. Uh, so you know, in English, for example, you can say, this is a mouse, and that could be, this is a mouse, or this is a mouse, or this is a mouse, or this is a mouse. And there's many different ways to emphasize a sentence to communicate a point. Um, and what we look for as a team is we make these tweaks, we run experiments, we see uh, what we call media precision for media matching, which is how often do users overwrite the decision that a machine has made. Um, so in a sense, it's a lot like scientific experiments. We have a hypothesis of a certain approach to do a certain thing, and we train the system on that data set, and then we watch, we see how the data, what the data tells us. So are users responding positively to the new way of decision making, uh, or was it better before? And there's a lot of times where we're experimenting, and it turns out that it's not a step in the right direction. So we roll back those changes, and we take a different approach. So it's a lot of experimentation and reading the data to see how users are responding to different approaches to AI. Now, the, okay, so when they get it, when it gets it wrong, and it learns from that, right? There's not obviously like a, like it's not like there's a, one, a binary choice, right? So it's not like oh, this was wrong, so it's got to be this. Right. So how does it know, right. you know, what to try next or does it, does it just try something? Yeah. So our algorithm, uh, well, well just specifically for media matching, cause it's probably easier to talk about is let's say you're talking about, um, uh, New York. And so the system might have some guesses of, is it New York, the city, is it New York, uh, a sports team? Is it New York, a company based in New York? Uh, and what it does is it gives us a, a confidence score where, Oh, it's 100% confident this is New York, the city, 90% confident that it's a New York sports team, 80% confident that it's a company based in New York, and so forth. And so when, um, when the system receives a, a signal that it's made the wrong decision, it would kind of fall down onto the 90% confidence, 80% confidence, and so forth. So it's not um, the system isn't making one selection. The user receives one selection, but the system makes a series of selections based on a confidence score, and that allows us to, to kind of tweak and look at, oh, how come the system thought this was com more confident than the other when it turns out that the other was correct? And then we look at other uh, data sources as well, because sometimes the, the article itself, um, as we mentioned at the beginning, you can drop in, simply drop in an article or a blog post, and Lumen5 will create a video for you. So we, we would look at the article and say, were there any clues that could have told the system that it, it was actually referring to one specific thing? Uh, one prime example is, let's say you're talking about markets and marketing. But markets could refer to financial markets, economic markets, but it could, it could also refer to a fish market or a grocery store, a fruit market. Right. Um, but the article itself tells us lots of things. If you wrote a blog post about a fruit market, you probably mentioned other keywords uh, like, like apples, bananas, and so forth. And so um, what we teach the system to do is to read other contexts and other keywords available within the content source to be able to disambiguate. Yeah. Okay. And that's, I mean, this is like fascinating to me. Um, obviously it's, it's like blowing my mind a little bit. Uh, you know, one of the, like when I give examples of uh, machine learning to people, when I talk about this stuff, one of the, one of the ones, and you can actually tell me if I'm, I'm like wrong about this, but if you show a person 
a car, a, like a picture of a Cadillac, and you say, you know, where is this car from? Most people, most adults will say America, right? And you show them a BMW, where is this from? They'll say Germany. Uh, but you couldn't necessarily explain why, the cat, right? You couldn't say like, well, I know the Cadillac's American, but I don't exactly know why. But if you show the machine that enough, right, it should be able to reverse engineer what makes that an American car versus a German car. Right, yeah. So certain shapes, you know, certain, certain designs that culturally we're used to. So when you see an American car, you have a certain idea of a Mustang, a, right. a, maybe a little boxy. And when you're thinking European car, maybe you're thinking a little smoother, a little more elegant. Um, that kind of stuff is absolutely fascinating. Uh, it's, it's kind of beyond human comprehension when we get the, to that point, because I can look at whatever 100 images a day, but the machine is look, looking at thousands and millions. And every single time a query is made, it's studying the selections and behaviors across a very large data set in a way that we as individuals just simply can't. Yeah. And so last sort of thing here, too, is what I love about this is that uh, I, I feel like, especially like with the work that I do, well, I mean, just, just general, when we're working with founders or people who are like high performers, there's this uh, innate skill that some people have to sort of pick a winner, you know, whether that's like they know the best stock that's going to be in a good investment or they know uh, a person who's going to be a good hire, like there's, you know, they have that sort of intuition. And a lot of people feel like that's irre irreplaceable in them. And like, they, they are the only ones who can do that. But I feel like if you show some, um, an algorithm enough, like you can in uh, actually replace a lot of those things that you might think are your unique ability. Right. I think uh, we see that across all sorts of different sectors and self-driving car is the hotly debated subject right now, uh, which is that humans aren't really good at driving. Uh, and, and even, despite how complex it is day and night and all the different obstacles and different things happening and deers crossing the streets and so forth. Uh, but a system is able to simply process more information. And I think a lot of times when it comes to decision making, what we call gut instinct is actually just a reflection of our experiences or observations over a long period of time. Um, but machines simply just have more to work with. They can make better decisions because they can see more things. They can remember more things. They can recognize patterns. Uh, and I think pattern recognition is the basis of human decision as a whole. When, we're, when we say, oh, we know how to make a good hire, it's, what we're really saying is that we've seen enough people to know who tends to outperform and we recognize the quirks that makes someone a good hire and so forth. Um, but we are limited by our limited time in, in terms of experiences, whether you're 20 or 30 years old or 40 years old, that's a 20 or 30 40 years of experience and observations, but machines can inherit data sets that are from <laughs> decades ago and expand far beyond what a typical lifespan is able to do. And that's why they're able to recognize more patterns and process more data and see more things and oftentimes make better decisions. Yeah, okay, so that's that's like an awesome sort of sum up in my opinion, is just that the machine just has so much more information available to it and that data is what really makes it so much more powerful. Uh, and on that, and on that note, right. you know, I, I think one of the, the fallacies of artificial intelligence is that we're modeling it after our own brains. We're really not. Yeah, I, it's kind of a collective intelligence. Yeah. Um, is, you know, AI is not isolated. Our, our brains are somewhat isolated in our own skulls, but machines communicate with each other. Data sets can be combined. AI can be built on top of each other. Uh, and that collective intelligence creates some very interesting results. Yeah, well, okay, so cool. So the last question I always like to ask in these interviews is, uh, what are your top three pieces of advice for people to be more effective? And you can interpret that however you like. Yeah, I, I think um, one thing that I always keep in mind is never try to do anything alone. Uh, and, and I always, always start businesses with partners with very diverse skill sets. I think if you're, especially if you're looking to start a business or providing any kind of service uh, and being an entrepreneur, it's so important to have on your team diverse skill sets. I alone could never fathom that Lumen5 is possible, um, but it takes someone with an idea. It takes someone with the capabilities to actually execute on, on that idea. And I think it's when people come together and pull together their resources and knowledge and skill sets that you can build something that uh, individually you could have never imagined possible. And to this day, I'm still surprised that Lumen5 has come this far and how, how much we've been able to do. Because I don't know, I when I first started, I didn't know anything about AI. And it wasn't until we started hiring people in this space who are much smarter than ourselves um, that Every single time we brought on more people with diverse skill sets, we just took the company and the product to the next level. Uh, and I think everyone who's interested in doing anything at all should never try to go at it alone. There's just so much benefit to working with others, um, especially people who are, who are very different. And oftentimes that can be tricky 
you know, we naturally tend to gravitate towards people who are very similar to ourselves. Um, but where the value and in innovation really comes about is when you interact and collaborate with people who are very different from yourself. And so one of my tip would definitely be to step outside of your comfort zone. Uh, I know a lot of people don't like networking and I don't, I, I don't refer to networking as showing up to an event and handing out business cards, but I mean, interacting with people outside of your own social circle, doing things, hobbies that maybe you normally don't find yourself being interested in, but that's really the surest way to meet people that are different. Uh, and that's where I think collaboration and innovation can really thrive. Awesome. That's great, Mike. Thank you so much for your time. And where can people find out more and sign up and try it out? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, of course, lumen5.com. One great tidbit that I want to add is that as a team, we always have the philosophy of offering a really strong free plan. So you can sign up for free. You don't have to pay anything. You can create unlimited videos for free, and that's how much confident we have in the system. There's optional things that you can upgrade for, but it's completely optional. Otherwise, you can create videos for free, and that's at lumen5.com, L-U-M-E-N, and that's just the number five. Dot com And personally, I can be reached at mike at lumen5.com. So if you have any questions, anybody needs any help uh, with their videos, feel free to reach out. Always happy to help. Thanks, Mike. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Less Doing Podcast. If you'd like to get more done in less time, join our exclusive community of entrepreneurs and visionaries, the Less Doing Labs. It's free and just for you. Go to lessdoinglabs.com slash more done.